there's just a lot going on in there. But for now, we will focus on the second coming, which is where we are in our study of Jesus in high definition. So Matthew chapter 24, as we make our way through the life of Jesus, as you know, we're into his last week now, Tuesday of his final week. Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are what has come to be called the Olivet Discourse. We'll be finishing that, and I imagine we'll have probably two more weeks in the Olivet Discourse and then we'll move forward to the Thursday of Jesus' final week because Wednesday was a day of rest for him. Nothing happened on the Wednesday of the final week, interestingly enough. And I'm sure he and the disciples were getting ready for all that was to follow on Thursday and Friday and then, of course, resurrection on Sunday. So we are making our way ever so surely but slowly to the end of Jesus' life and then we will get into Peter in high definition and the book of Acts probably right around the first of the year. So lots going on. Kind of fun, isn't it? So let's get into this. We're at the part now of the Olivet Discourse where we're talking about the second coming. So a lot to discuss. Matthew 24, I want to read verses 29 and 30 from the New King James Version. And in honor of God's word, if you would stand with me, please. This is what Jesus said. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What in the world does all of that mean? Let's pray together. And as always, we have a lot to talk about. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together tonight. There is so much going on with our little faith family and each of the names that have already been mentioned tonight. We lift to you and ask for your presence to be very obvious in the lives of those who are celebrating as we anticipate the birth of a child, with those who are anticipating a pretty significant surgery, with those in our group who are mourning a loss, with just a lot going on. And so we ask your blessing now upon these few moments that we have together with each other. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. All right, with Jesus' words here in Matthew 24, the climax of human history as we know it, will occur. It is amazing to me how many people, whether they are of a religious bent or not, have the sense, and you do, many of you as well, that we are headed for a climax of history, that things cannot continue going as they are going at the same rate that they are going for much longer on every level. Our world is headed toward some kind of a climax. The question is, when will it happen and what will it look like? Well, Jesus won't tell us when it will happen. In fact, he will tell us just the opposite. He will not tell us when it's going to happen, but he will tell us much of what it will look like. But I can tell you this, no one will miss it. No one will mistake it. Everyone will know exactly what it is that is happening, and everyone will know exactly why it is happening. And the it to which I referred and repeated in that above sentence is the second coming of Jesus. This is what Jesus said. Then all the tribes of the earth will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Quite a contrast, if you think about it, from Jesus' first coming. His first coming was seen only by a very few people, lowly shepherds, out in the fields, in the remote regions of Bethlehem, when he came the first time, he did not come with power and great glory, but he came, as you know, as a newborn baby laid in an animal's manger in the cold of a cave. But here, in the run-up to the crucifixion and in its immediate aftermath, the disciples were understandably fixated on the future, wanting to know exactly what was going to happen and when it was going to happen. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's what they asked him on this Tuesday before the crucifixion on the Mount of Olives, after the resurrection, and just before Jesus ascended into heaven from the region of the Mount of Olives. This is what we read in the book of Acts, and this is what they asked. Just listen. While the apostles were still with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you 
to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'll pause and interject. They've done a really good job of that. You and I sitting here today are evidence of that. Their witness of who Jesus was and what Jesus taught has reached all the way around the world, even to our humble little town here of McMinnville, and to each of us. And after Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken away from you into heaven, now listen, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. That is Acts chapter 1. Now, as you can imagine, I'm dying to explain all of that to you in all of its glorious and colorful detail, but we'll hold off until we break the seal on the book of Acts sometime right around the first of the year, Lord willing. Point is, the disciples were fixated on the future, wanting to know when these events would take place, and these two angels that appeared to them, interesting, by the way, he addressed them as men of Galilee, couldn't have done that before Judas defected and betrayed Jesus, because Judas was the one of the twelve apostles who was not from Galilee. Interestingly enough, he was from Judea, but I'll say more about Judas in the coming weeks and his betrayal. Now he was long gone, and so the angel appropriately addressed the disciples, the remaining 11, as men of Galilee. Anyway, to them the angel said, he will come back. And from that moment, up to and including this present moment, Jesus' followers have continuously wondered the exact same thing. What will be the sign of Jesus coming? And ironically, even though Jesus clearly said it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, for the 2,000 years that have intervened since the angels made that proclamation and Jesus talked about his second coming on the Mount of Olives, for 2,000 years so many have made so many predictions about the date and the time. Every one of them frustrated. Obviously, those dates and times have come and gone, and there's a lot of eggs on a lot of faces of a lot of Bible teachers who have tried over the years to tell you the date and the time. How ironic in that Jesus said you're not to know the date nor the time, and Jesus said he'll come when you least expect it. So if anybody did set a date and a bunch of people were up on top of a mountain waiting for that date to come, they forfeited it just by their expectation. So we don't know what the date or the time is, we can sense the season. I'll say more about that in a minute. He did make clear, Jesus did, that we can sense that the season is approaching, but the date or the time, that remains to be seen. So while we don't know exactly when it is going to happen, we do know exactly what will happen. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. When is Jesus coming back? Well, we don't know for sure, but we do know for sure that it has been a longing that has burned brightly and deeply and passionately in the hearts of many a committed Christ follower all around the world, all through human history, including, I would imagine, many of us who are waiting and longing as well, and for a very good reason. As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, even creation itself has been growing as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, and we believers also groan for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for that day. Don't you? I certainly do, as do many of the rest of us. You can hear it in the words of the New Testament writers. It's like a steady drumbeat that reverberates throughout the entire soundtrack of each of their scriptural sonatas, this longing for Jesus to return. As but one example, I could give you many tonight, but we're always fighting the clock. I'll just give you one example. You can feel the tension. It is palpable in what Peter wrote to his original readers concerning this matter of the time and the date of Jesus' second coming. The tension was so great in the hearts of his readers 
that he devoted the entire final chapter of his final letter to addressing this very issue. Now, I don't often take the time to read to you an entire chapter of Scripture, but I am going to read this one to you because it perfectly frames our discussion tonight. And in its words, pretty simple to understand, though when we get to Peter in high definition, we'll pick 1 Peter and 2 Peter apart phrase by phrase, so you won't be missing a thing. But as I read this to you, you can tell how timely this is. If it was timely at the time that Peter wrote it, how much more timely is it? for us. And if there was much confusion back then about the timing of Jesus' second coming, we can understand why there's so much confusion today. And if there was so much anticipation of Jesus' second coming in Peter's original readers, imagine the anticipation in the hearts of his readers today. So there's a lot going on here. Let me just read to you with minimal comment, if I can restrain myself, the third chapter of the book of Second Peter. This is what Peter wrote. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago. That's the Old Testament. And what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. That's the New Testament. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, now you tell me if you sense that we are in the last days. Scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? For before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. You claim to believe Jesus is coming back? Really? You really believe that? As if it is some kind of a fairy tale, and the embedded lie in that, the assumption that undergirds that is, that history is nothing more than an endless ongoing repetition of cycles, that history always repeats itself, that history is circular rather than linear with a definite beginning and a definite end. The beginning being creation, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the end, the climax of it all, when Jesus comes back. So, undergirding the scoffers who mock the very things that we're talking about tonight is this notion that life has just endlessly repeated itself, ongoing cycles, and it will continue like this forever, life as we know it. They deliberately forget, Peter continues, that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command and brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. In other words, History is not circular, an endless, ongoing, repeating series of cycles, but it is linear with a definite beginning. They forget that God created it all. There was a starting point, and then by implication, an ending point. Then God used water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. They forget that God intervened in human history with Noah and the flood. Interesting that Peter invokes the image of Noah. We'll be talking more about Noah in a second. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. There is an end coming, Peter wrote. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. There's a lot that goes into that statement. It basically, very simply means God's not bound by time like you and I are. God is not bound by time like we are. And so while we think he is being slow in fulfilling his promise, when's Jesus coming back? When Jesus is coming back, it's been 2,000 years, right? To God, that's like two days. So God is being patient, but it seems a lot longer to us than it does to him. Anyway, I'd like to spend more time on that phrase, and we will when we do Peter in high definition. But for now, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No. He is being patient for your sake. Why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Why is God being so patient? Here's why Peter wrote. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. But he wants everyone to repent. Meaning to turn to him. But the day of the Lord will come. There was a beginning. There will be an end. The day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, 
and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That's why he's waiting. One more day for one more person. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand. I love that. If Peter struggled with some of the things Paul wrote, no wonder you and I do when we read Paul's letters. What does that mean? And Why does it take so much effort to explain it all? Well, Peter understood that. A lot of what Paul wrote is tough stuff. So, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture. Choose your rabbi carefully, my friends, right? And this will result in their destruction. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on your guard, then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All glory to him both now and forever. Amen. That's the entire chapter. That's how 2 Peter ends. They were waiting. We are waiting. They were longing. We are longing. They were asking, when's it going to happen? What's taking so long? We are asking, when is it going to happen? What is taking so long what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age the disciples asked jesus when he gave his answer in what we call the olivet discourse because he taught it high atop the mount of olives this is what jesus said matthew 24 39 that is the way it will be when the son of man comes matthew 24 42 so you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your lord is coming matthew 24 44 you also must be ready all the time for the son of man will come when least expected matthew 25 31 but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit upon his glorious throne and that's what jesus said just in the olivet discourse not including everything else that he said in the span of his three and a half years of teaching about his second coming. The point of the Olivet Discourse is that Jesus is coming back. He says he he comes, he is coming, he will come, and he comes in his glory. Four times in the Olivet Discourse. I am coming back, I am coming back, I am coming back, I am coming back. So, with all of that background, let's discover together tonight what Jesus did teach us in the Olivet Discourse about his second coming. And as we do, keep in mind there is no shortage of people today who will gleefully mock what we are saying here tonight. I mean, that's what Peter said, right? In the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth, and trust me, they are here. I have been asked in a myriad of ways by multiple people over many different years You don't really believe that, do you? That Jesus is coming back? Really, really, you believe that? I believe that. Because Jesus said that. This is what he said in John 14. After I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. How many times and in how many ways did he say it? I will come back. And here's the problem. That the mockers and the scoffers must consider. It's the old story. Jesus said he's coming back. That leaves us with three options. Either he knew he wasn't coming back, but promised over and over and over again that he was, which makes him a liar. Or he's not coming back, but he really thought he was going to come back, which makes him a lunatic. Or he told us the truth. 
I mean, really, it reduces the options to very few, doesn't it? Or I can put it to you this way. If he is not coming back, then we do not have the option of saying that Jesus was a good man or a good teacher or a moral man or a man who was a skilled communicator or an example to be respected and followed, if he said over and over and over again, I am coming back, but he isn't coming back, that he was either deluded into thinking that he was, which reduces him to a madman, delusional, an egomaniac of gargantuan proportions, or he just said it as a lie to manipulate and fool the people, rubes like you and me, then he wasn't a good man at all. He wasn't a man to be respected at all. He was not a man worthy of us dating our calendars by his birth. He was not a man worthy of us stamping on our money in God we trust. He was not a man who was worthy of us reading about him and his teachings in the New Testament. He was not a man worthy of the prophets of the Old Testament and all of the predictions that they made about his first coming, not to mention his second coming. So for those who want to conclude that we who believe that he is coming back are delusional, then to show Jesus any respect of any kind is intellectually dishonest. You see what I'm saying? So do I believe that he is coming back? No doubt about it. And as we talked in the last few weeks, the signs that he pointed out, six of them to look for, that the days are drawing short and his coming is going to be soon, those predictions that he made 2,000 years ago read like today's morning newspaper. But we've already talked at length about that. I don't need to repeat that now. So the fact is, Jesus is coming back. And the minute that he does come back, here are the things that will happen. I'm simply going to walk you through the Olivet Discourse and give a minimal comment to explain exactly what Jesus said. He started out with this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, this will happen. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus was quoting, by the way, the great prophet Isaiah when he said all of that. That is a verbatim, word-for-word -word quote out of Isaiah 13, verse 10, and Isaiah 34, 4. Isaiah believed that Jesus was coming back as well. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled by many commentators and a lot of hot air expelled by many Bible teachers trying to explain exactly what all of that means. Sun will be darkened, moon will not give its light, stars will fall from heaven. And the question is, really, was Isaiah... And was Jesus speaking literally when he said that, or figuratively? Will the sun really be blotted out? Will the moon really, it, like a light bulb, be turned off? Will stars actually fall down from heaven, flaming suns that they are each? Is that really going to happen? Is it literal or is it figurative? So let's talk about this. Let me put it all into proper perspective if I can. And if you've been here the last few weeks, this will be familiar territory to you. And if not, then you might want to review the podcast. By the time that happens, we know that Satan, in the person of what the book of Revelation calls the beast, what Paul called the man of lawlessness, what we typically call the Antichrist, by the time that this happens, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, etc. By the time that happens, Satan will, in the person of the Antichrist, he will have desecrated the temple. He will have sat upon God's throne. He will have proclaimed himself to be God. He will have erected a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies, in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And the edict will have been issued worldwide that everyone in the world will have to bow down and worship Satan as God. All of that will have happened, which comes full circle as far as Isaiah 14 is concerned. It was in Isaiah 14 that Lucifer proclaimed to God, I will be like the Most High. I will make myself you. I'm taking over. I will be God. That is what Lucifer has wanted from the beginning. It is what Lucifer, now Satan, 
wants in the present, and it is what he will proclaim in the future when he desecrates the temple and proclaims himself God. We know from Revelation 16 that in one last desperate act to fulfill that declaration, this will happen at Satan's direction. Demonic spirits will go out to all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. And the demonic spirits gathered all of the rulers and their armies to a place in Hebrew named Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. So there is coming a day, as you know, when Satan will gather the multiplied military might of the nations of the world together in that natural battlefield called today the Jezreel Valley. It has seen a lot of blood over the many years of human history flow into its soil. It sits right at the base of Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, and the armies will be amassed there in one last cynical attempt on the part of Satan and his demons to declare a final war against God and overthrow him. In direct response to that, Jesus will make a declaration of his own in Revelation 16. Look, Jesus will say, I am coming. An announcement of his second coming. And the battle of Armageddon the mother of all battles, will be fought, literally in the shadow of Tel Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, or Har Megiddo, Armageddon, where the combined military might of the nations coupled with the forces of hell itself will collide with and be defeated by the forces of heaven. Now again, I know that to the scoffers and the mockers, that is, sounds like a wild tale, the stuff of fantasy, the stuff of horror. But what no scoffer can deny is that there is in place today in our world an absolute collision of forces of evil versus forces of good, both operating in our world, both colliding in our world today. The book of Revelation, as I have told you in the past, simply gives a name to it. It will be Satan versus God and a location to the climax of the final battle. It will be below the hill of Megiddo. And I get shivers to this day every time I stand on top of that hill of Megiddo and I look out over that vast battlefield. Napoleon fought there. Alexander the Great fought there. I mean, the great commanders of the great armies of the world have marched through there time and time again. And it is a natural staging area for the battle of all battles. Now remember that the book of Revelation, this is, this is an important point and something for you to file away for future reference, especially when you read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation contains a lot of wild-eyed descriptions of some really bizarre things going on in the end times. So the question could be asked, what is the interpretive key to understanding the book of Revelation? How do we interpret it properly? Is it literal? Is it figurative? How do we know when it is speaking literally? How do we know when it is speaking figuratively? How do we make those decisions? And what really is going on in the book of Revelation? Well, the interpretive key is this. And remember this, whenever you are reading the book of Revelation, or any prophetic literature in the Bible, what some people call apocalyptic literature, uh, that is, prophecies about the end times. The book of Revelation is written in the language of appearance. In other words, when you read it, this is what it looks like. Okay? This is what it looks like. Some of you look confused. Let me explain. Revelation 1, verse 11. This is the interpretive key that opens up the whole book. This is what John was told, who wrote the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, 11. Write in a book everything you see. So if you can imagine John, a first century uneducated fisherman, 
which he was, marooned on the island of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation, which he was, and as he saw in his mind's eye a glorious vision of what would be happening in the end times, some of it in heaven, some of it on earth, he wrote down furiously what he was seeing and describing it as it appeared to him. Okay, does that make sense to you? Okay, he is writing down what he saw. And what he saw was this, Revelation 16. The demonic spirits gathered all of the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne of the temple, saying, It is finished. He saw this. It happened. He watched it. And he wrote it down as he saw it. Does that make sense to you? So, in that sense, what he saw was indeed to be taken by us literally. He saw this happening and he wrote it as he watched it. Where we get into trouble is that some of the things that he saw that sound really bizarre to us, you just have to understand that he's writing it in terminology that an uneducated first century fisherman would describe it. So if he describes, for example, these scorpions that seem to come out of the earth and are stinging everybody, with fire coming out of them. He's not describing some crazy fire-breathing dragon. If you were a first century uneducated fisherman marooned on an island writing all of this and you saw an Apache helicopter attacking a bunch of troops on the ground, how would you describe it? You might describe it as a scorpion breathing fire. Does that make sense to you? So was this literal? Yes, in the sense that he saw it and he is describing it. When we try to attach specificity to every little thing that he described, this means this and this means this, we can get into trouble because he was only writing down what he saw. I probably told you more tonight than I need to about the book of Revelation because that's really not the focus of tonight. But some of what I'm going to read to you just sounds really bizarre. So did this really happen in the literal sense or is he simply writing what he's describing? You'll see what I mean as I read this. It is finished, God declares from the throne, meaning the end has come. There was a definite beginning to human history. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. There is a definite end coming. This is it. Human history, as we know it, is now finished. And this colossal, titanic battle between good and bad that you and I are embroiled in right now in real time, the evidence of that battle all around us, you yourself as an individual, like me, being torn by two forces that oppose each other, the desire to do good things, the desire to do bad things, and how many of us have been hurt by people who have chosen to do bad things, and our world today scourged by those who choose to do bad things, like blowing up innocent people. So this battle will come to an end. That's why the world is groaning, as Paul described it. And finally, when God proclaims it is finished, and Jesus comes to put an end to it all, the whole world collectively, and you and I individually, will breathe a huge sigh of relief. Okay, here's what John saw and heard. Then the thunder crashed and rolled, and lightning flashed, and a great earthquake struck, the worst since people were placed on the earth. The great city of Babylon, that is a, that is a title, a, a symbol of everything and everyone who opposes God. In, in trying to describe it all in a, in a phrase, in a word, John describes it all as Babylon because historically, biblically, Babylon has the connotation of all that is evil, right? Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire and all of that. So, Reaching back, an uneducated first century fisherman who knew the Old Testament, reaching back and trying to figure out a metaphor to describe all that represents evil in the world, he summarizes it all by calling it Babylon. So, the city of Babylon, all that is evil and wicked in the world, split into three sections and the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins. Those are the sins of mankind from the dawning of human history. 
and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. Every island disappeared, and all the mountains were leveled. Now, did that really literally happen, or is that how it appeared in the fog of war as the battle of Armageddon is being waged? Um, I remember listening to, forgive me for such a, I mean, compared to this, kind of a trite example, but listening to Vince Scully describe a Dodger game, and he was just, it was very smoggy in Los Angeles on this particular afternoon, and he said, the hills behind the scoreboard in left field have disappeared. Well, they didn't literally disappear. He couldn't see them. You get what I'm saying? So if you read the book of Revelation in that way, this is what John is describing, then it makes a whole lot of sense that in the fog of this battle, I mean, I can't imagine what it will look like. And picture in my mind what he saw. Every island disappeared. All of the mountains were leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm. The hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below. What is that? Is that literal hailstones? Is that... <laughs> When you amass the military might of the nations of the world into this gigantic collision of good versus bad, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things falling from heaven. What is all of that? The point is that it's going to be spectacular in an awesome way, a, a battle the likes of which the world has never seen before. They cursed God, the people did, because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. That's Revelation 16. That's what John saw in this epic battle, the mother of all battles, the Battle of Armageddon. How would you describe it if you were writing in the first century and were uneducated? And I don't mean that as a pejorative. He himself describes himself that way. He just didn't have the formal training of an education. He was a fisherman by trade. But oh, how the scoffers love to mock all of that. As if they and this world is invincible. And you'd have to be mad to believe any of that. What he saw. Revelation 18. After all this I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority. And the earth grew bright with his splendor. He gave a mighty shout. Babylon is fallen. The great city is fallen. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt. For every impure spirit. A hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. Babylon's evil and immoral wine has made all the nations drunk. Every king on the earth has slept with her. Every merchant on earth is rich because of her evil desires. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven, come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven and God remembers her deeds. And then to God, the angels say this, Do to her as she has done to others, double her penalty for all of her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brew twice as much for her. That woman honored herself with a life of luxury, reward her now with suffering and pain. I mean, you can, you can feel the longing in the hearts of so many for justice in this world finally to be done and evil to be brought to its justified end, and for righteousness finally to prevail. And the, for the world as we know it, fundamentally to be changed into a world where goodness prevails, and where evil is finally punished. Deep in her heart, Babylon said, I am the queen. Never will I be a widow or know what it means to be sad. And so in a single day she will suffer the pain of sorrow, hunger, and death. She will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see smoke rising from her charred remains. That is, the system that is in place now of evil in the world will completely collapse. And John saw it. The charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. 
at last God will have judged her for her sins. Wow. So when Jesus said, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, you'd better believe it. In those four phrases, Jesus described all that I have read to you from Revelation 16 and Revelation 18. It will be a bloodbath the likes of which this world has never seen before. Imagine the devil and every demon fighting furiously in desperation because they sense that their end is near. So Jesus continued in the Olivet Discourse, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That sign that Jesus is talking about, the sign of the Son of Man, understand this, Jesus doesn't need a sign. Jesus is the sign. You understand that? When he returns, everyone will see him. When he comes back, everyone will know who he is. When he appears, everyone will know what they have done to him, and everyone will mourn because of him. They will not need a sign to point them to him. He is the sign. He is the sign that life as they have known it is over. The end has come, and the day of reckoning has finally arrived. That's the sign. And then Jesus told a parable. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even when you see all these things, all of the things that we have discussed in the past weeks, the signs of the times, the abomination of desolation, we described that to you a couple of weeks ago, this battle of Armageddon that I just described to you now, when you see all of that happen, you know that it the it being the end of human history as we know it, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation certainly will not pass away until all these things have happened. What generation? The generation alive during the tribulation that sees this battle take place. That will be the terminal generation on the earth. Now, a lot of date setters have made a lot of hay out of that statement about certainly this generation shall not pass away until all these things have happened. I remember reading, I wasn't alive then, when 1948, when Israel became a state, rising up out of the ashes of the Holocaust. For 2,000 years, from AD 70 until 1948, as you know, there was no Israel. And then all of a sudden, with a vote of the United Nations, Israel was reconstituted as a nation. And people said, one generation from then will see Jesus return. A typical generation is 40 years. So if that happened in 1948, Jesus has to come back by 1988. This is what date setters do. They play around with numbers and they take phrases like this and twist them completely out of its context. All Jesus said was, when you see these things happen, most notably now for tonight's discussion, the Battle of Armageddon, you know that you're the generation who is going to witness the end. There will not be a generation after this. This is the end. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said. But my words will never pass away. So, scoff all you want, but I, for one, will take Jesus at his word. He said he is coming back, and I believe that he is coming back. If he lied about it, if he is some kind of a madman who, in a fit of delusion, imagined it, then we shouldn't even celebrate Christmas in his honor, let alone Easter, right? But I believe what he said, and I believe what he said when he said, my words will never pass away. So there is an end coming. Or in the words of Revelation 16, a mighty shout came from the throne in the temple saying, it is finished. Human history as we know it. So you better believe that the peoples of this world will mourn as they have never mourned before. Okay, let's finish this. This is amazing. Matthew 24. Jesus said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But, Jesus said, 
Get this. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So, as in the days of Noah, meaning that evil in this world had reached a level never seen before that required God to intervene in human history in an unprecedented way with a worldwide flood. Jesus made clear that immediately preceding his second coming, evil in the world will again reach an apex, a crescendo, a level never before seen in the world. I would suggest to you that we are rapidly approaching that point now. As in the days of Noah, And then Jesus said this, which is often misunderstood, so listen carefully. Then, two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. You've heard this, right? Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. People have said, incorrectly so, that that is referring to the rapture. Which is why so many people get the rapture and the second coming confused. Because they read that here in Matthew 24, and conclude Jesus must be talking about the rapture because that's what's going to happen when the rapture occurs, right? You're going to have two men in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Isn't that the rapture? No. What's the difference? The difference is that when the rapture occurs, at the beginning of the tribulation, those of us who love Christ will be taken up to be with him. Yes, two people may be in a field and one will be taken, and that one will be taken to meet the Lord in the air and to be with the Lord forever and ever, right? 1 Thessalonians 4. What happens here? Well, listen to what Jesus said. The flood came and took them all away. Talking about Noah. And then immediately after that, he said, then two will be in the field and one will be taken away. These are not taken away to meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever and ever. These are people taken away into judgment. Do you see it? Okay, listen to it again. Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Two men will be in the field and one will be taken away. Two women will be grinding in a mill. One will be taken away and the other left. One of those two, a Christ follower. One of those two, an Antichrist follower. The Antichrist follower will be swept away in judgment just as the people were during the flood. Do you see that? This is going to be the second coming. This is going to be a time of judgment. In the exact same manner then, Jesus said, as it was true in the flood, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, two women will be grinding at a mill, one will be taken. These people are not taken in the rapture to meet the Lord in the air. They are taken at the end of the tribulation to stand before Almighty God in judgment, where, according to Revelation chapter 20, each person will be judged according to what they had done. This is a person being taken away into judgment. What happens to the one who is left? They will enter with Jesus into that glorious period of time called the millennium, which I'll get to in just a second. But that explains then what Jesus said immediately after that in Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, you do not know at what hour your Lord is coming. So to the people of the tribulation, who are enamored with the Antichrist and who are tempted to take his mark and pledge their devotion to him, you better watch out because you do not know the hour at which the Lord is coming. And if you take his mark, you will be taken away in judgment. This is what happened right before the flood. And since Jesus compared it to what will happen right before his second coming, it is appropriate to read it. Genesis 6, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Sound like many in our world today? So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. 
Well, I got to tell you, his heart is going to be broken yet again. In fact, I would suggest it already is. When God looks upon our world today, do you think he is pleased? It doesn't get much worse than what will happen during the tribulation when, according to Revelation 13, the whole world will worship the beast, the Antichrist, as Jesus Christ. You think it's bad now, just wait. So in Noah's day, the heavens opened and the floods came. In the days of the tribulation, a yet future day, as the armies of the world and the armies of hell itself gather together and assemble at the base of the hill of Megiddo, Har Megiddo, Armageddon, once again the heavens will open. But this time it won't be a flood that comes. This time it will be Jesus who comes. Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly, and he wages a righteous war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. The armies of heaven, those are all of the angels and all of us, who will join him in heaven during the rapture, followed him on a white horse. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like the juice flowing out of a wine press. And on his robe and at his thigh was written his title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is going to be quite a scene. This is how the battle ends. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who did many mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue, that statue placed in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. There won't even be a shot fired. Jesus will merely speak the word. And the armies of hell will be defeated. And then John trying to describe this as he looks upon that battlefield is reduced to describing it with this one sentence in Revelation 19, the vultures all gorge themselves on the dead bodies. It will be a bloodbath. What a spectacular finish to human history as we know it. A battle that will be years in the making, but it will be split seconds in the fighting. Jesus will merely open his mouth and the armies of hell and earth will be defeated. But let's end this on a happy note. Revelation 20. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. Those are people who become Christ followers during the tribulation. And the beast, the Antichrist, has them killed. And we know his method of slaughter, not unlike ISIS. Today they will be beheaded for their faith in Christ. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And that will begin that blessed period of time, a utopia, a true utopia, called the Millennium. But that's a topic for another time. For this time, tonight, all you need to remember is this. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He wins. And when he wins, we win. Aren't you glad you picked the right side? 
Well, Father, we have talked about some sobering realities tonight. Spectacular sounding, fanciful tales written so many hundreds of years ago. And yet we sense, we sense in a profound way that history as we know it is indeed headed to a climax. How long can things continue as they are before the human race destroys itself? And how desperately we need you to intervene. How we long for this day to come and for this day to come quickly. And how we long to hear the words thundered from the throne in the temple in Jerusalem when you will declare for all the world to hear that finally, mercifully, it is finished. It is finished. And righteousness will reign. May that day come quickly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a lot there, I know. And I know I read a whole lot more scripture than I typically do, and there's a danger in that because you're not hearing me talk, you're hearing me read. But I wanted you to hear most of that unfiltered, just the way John wrote it. Let me leave you with this blessing, and now may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Jesus in High Definition podcast. Could you do me a favor? If you found it to be a blessing, could you please spread the word? Share it on Facebook, email your contact list with a link to this podcast, let your friends know that we're here. I would greatly appreciate it. And while you're at it, check out my good friends at the e2medianetwork.com, e2medianetwork.com, for some compelling podcasts on a variety of subjects. I think you'll enjoy it. Join the conversation. Let us know what you think. Give us your feedback. We would love to hear from you.